Hello friends. Well, this is video number 12 in our series, Praying Romans, and today we're taking a look at Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 25. And in this video review of this particular passage, I want to talk about what Paul is doing in this chapter. I want to try to answer the question, who is he talking about in verses 14 through 25? And finally, I want to say just a very brief word about application how we might apply this passage to our own lives. So first of all, let's talk about what Paul is doing here. It looks to me like Paul is once again continuing to answer possible objections in this passage. It's as if he anticipates what his readers may be saying or thinking, and he's going to respond to their questions. So he poses a question in verse 7 that may have come from his original readers. And this is how their question may have sounded. After all that you have said, Paul, about the law, how it is that we are not justified by the law, and how that sinful passions are aroused by the law, are you saying that the law, the law that we hold dear to us, that we hold precious to us, the law of Moses, are you saying that the law is sinful, that it is sin? Paul must think that some may have erroneously concluded from what he has written about the law that the law is evil. So Paul responds, No, the law is not sinful. It only points out and defines what sin is. If we break the law and sin, the law is not to blame. We are, because we are the ones who rebelled against that which is holy, equitable, and intended for our welfare. Then in verse 17, no, I'm sorry, that would be verse 13. In verse 13, Paul asks, okay, did that good thing, the law, cause death? And again, his answer would be no. That sin is the villain. It was sin that killed him, he writes. Sin using the law as its instrument, or using the law as its base. Sin brought death through the commandment in order that sin might appear in its true nature. What he will say here is that the law was given in order that sin might be seen for what it truly is. So a good law is not to blame for our sin if people disobey it and bring punishment upon themselves. Now, what is Paul doing here in this text? He is defending the law. He has said that it cannot uh, make a person right before God, but it still promotes holiness. Uh, it, it, it is just in its demands, and it is still good in its results. So he wants to defend God's law. Then we have that difficult-to-understand passage in verses 14 through 25. The Apostle Peter, you may recall, once wrote that Paul wrote some things that were hard to understand, and my guess is that at least one of those passages, one of those difficult-to-understand passages, is this one in Romans chapter 7. I can think of some others that are difficult to understand too, but I would certainly classify this passage in that category. So, when Paul writes verses 14 through 25, the question is, well, let me just review briefly what he writes in verses 14 through 25. He says, I am of the flesh, verse 14. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. I, I, I. Is Paul speaking about himself in this passage, himself as a Christian, or is he speaking of himself when he was under the law, before he became a follower of Jesus? Another way of asking that is, is he talking about the person who is not a follower of Jesus in this passage, or is he talking about the experience of a person who is a follower of Jesus? Now, 
In verses 7 through 11, the tense is past, isn't it? The tense of the verbs in that passage is past, past tense. There, Paul is certainly referring to his pre-conversion experience. But of course you noticed that in verses 14 through 25, he abruptly shifts to the present tense. He certainly sounds like a Christian who is still struggling to say no to sin. And furthermore, the Christian life is the theme of chapters 5 through 8, right? Not the life of the unbeliever. And wouldn't we all say that our experience as Christians agrees with Paul's view of the tension between will and action in this text? That is, there is a sense in which we can all say, even as followers of Jesus Christ, that often we do not do the good that we want to do. We will to do good, but we just don't get around to doing it. We want to do right, but often we fail to do what is right. What Paul writes about himself, if indeed he is writing autobiographically, rings true to our own experience as Christians. So perhaps Paul is writing in this passage about his experience as a follower of Jesus. On the other hand, does what Paul write describe a Christian? Really? Sin is not defeated in this passage, but in chapter 6 it certainly is, because there Paul writes that followers of Jesus are no longer under the power of sin, no longer slaves of sin. Two, Paul has already said, and will say again in chapter 8, that the Christian life is one of peace, not inner conflict. The man that he's talking about in Romans chapter 7 is certainly plagued with inner conflict. Surely, after all, Paul has said in chapters 5 and 6, he is not describing himself as a Christian in chapter 7 when he writes, I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. Verse 14, when he writes, Sin dwells within me. Verses 17 and 20, when he writes, There is another law making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Verse 23, and Verse 25, with my mind I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. Could Paul be saying those things about himself as a follower of Jesus? I don't know. You know, Bible scholars are divided on the person that Paul is referring to in this passage, and you might want to know that there is no consensus among them. But for myself... I have been persuaded that Paul is talking about the plight of Jews under the law in this particular passage. He is describing their condition of despair. The condition of anyone, by the way, who tries to save himself or herself by obeying law. I think that Paul is describing people in their pre-Christian state. I think that notion, that interpretation, presents less difficulties than to suppose he is describing the condition of those who are Christians. I believe Paul then is picturing the helplessness of a sinner without Christ, someone without the saving power of the gospel, and by the way, someone in whom the Holy Spirit does not live. We already know that Paul has said to us that the Holy Spirit lives in us. So how can he say that the Spirit lives in us while at the same time saying that we are still under the power of sin and that nothing good lives in us? No, I lean to the idea, the interpretation that he's talking about a person who is not a Christian, a person who feels helpless to deal with his sin because he doesn't know Jesus. And then we come to verse 24 in our passage, where Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And here, Paul is presenting the condition of the man, and by the way, don't be misled by his use of the first-person pronoun, I. 
in this passage because in other passages he uses this same pronoun to refer to others. I'm thinking just here of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, well, Paul would never say I speak that way. He's putting himself in the person in the position of the person who may speak that way, but Paul himself wouldn't speak that way. But notice he uses the first person pronoun I. So don't be misled by the fact that he uses the first person pronoun I in Romans chapter 7. Paul is not talking about himself in 1 Corinthians 13, even though he's using that pronoun I. Okay, enough of that, Carrie. Back to verse 24. Here Paul is presenting the condition of the man who first finds himself completely under the dominion of sin and helpless in his desire to free himself. He knows no way of escape until Christ is revealed to him. Then he exclaims, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. At that point, this wretched man realizes that deliverance has come. In Christ Jesus, there is peace with God, life from spiritual death, and rest from the intolerable burden of sin. And there is the good news for us today. Because of what God did through Jesus Christ our Lord, we are freed from the burden of sin, freed from the guilt of sin, freed from the power of sin, freed from the dominion of sin, freed from the enslavement of sin. We are free from that horrible monster, thanks to what God did through Jesus Christ our Lord. And finally, we come to the end of chapter 7, and we are standing on the precipice of that beautiful chapter, one of the most beautiful chapters in all of the Bible, chapter 8. And we'll talk more about that wonderful chapter in next week's video review.